for those of you looking at the screen right now in the photograph of Michele that's on the lower right of the screen that was actually taken at an event that Tawny had in July this year at a place called the Iva Smith Memorial Gallery, which is up along the St. Lawrence River. Um, and we had a wonderful day, a gathering of people working on all different kinds of fiber projects. It was sort of a feast of different kinds of needlework techniques. And the, um, <laughs> thank you, Judith. Uh, Judith writes, the fiber fest was the best. And the dress that um, Michele is pointing to in that photograph is one that we'll be talking about this evening. So, so we, we actually had a few dozen people signed up for this evening, but we also know that people um, tend to kind of come in as they're able over the course of the event. So I think um, for those of you who are already here, I, I would suggest let's go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome to About Wool and Water. This evening, we're going to be talking about an exhibition of that name, Wool and Water, which is currently on display at the Tawny Center. It's a, an exhibition that shows um, pieces that are fiber works, which represent data about uh, water quality in the Adirondacks, different studies about water quality in the Adirondacks. And the scientist and fiber artist behind that is Michele Glennon, who is our guest this evening. So we're gonna be talking to her a little bit about her background, how she got involved with this project. Um, we'll be looking at some of the pieces that are in the exhibition. And then we'll have some questions for Michele about why she's doing this and what she hopes will happen out of this. Um, you are all muted right now. During the uh, main part of the program this evening, we ask that if you have any comments or questions, just go right ahead and put them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat the whole time and we'll be feeding comments and questions into the discussion as it seems appropriate and it works in the flow. At the end of this event, you will have the opportunity to unmute yourself and talk directly to me, Kaylee, and participate directly in the conversation if you'd like to. So let me start by introducing myself. I'm Jill Bright. I'm the executive director at Tawny, which is based in Canton, but we work in all of the North Country. Um, I'm a folklorist and Tawny, if you are new to the organization, um, is an organization, a nonprofit organization that documents and develops exhibits and programs about the diverse cultures, skills, and crafts of everyday life in New York's North Country, which for us includes the Adirondacks. Not everybody feels that the Adirondacks is the North Country, but we believe that it is. So we're essentially working in all of Northern New York. Um, we're a very active organization. We have a lot of different uh, programs and projects, initiatives going on. So in the chat, uh, Shuka has put some information about how you can find out more about Tawny. We post daily in our social media platforms. You can subscribe to our e-newsletter. And I'm not going to take away from any of Michele's time right now to talk about that in more detail, but we'd love to have you learn more about us and get involved with us. Um, my co-host this evening is Shuka Wei, who is Tawny's Director of Communications. And Shook is going to be uh, working here with me tonight to make sure that I, I don't overlook questions or comments and to help with the technology and to participate in the conversation herself. So hello, Shuka. Hi, everybody. Um, and let me introduce our guest for this evening, Michele Glennon. So um, Michele is the science director at Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute. She's especially interested in the effects of land use management on wildlife populations in the Adirondacks. Um, she's engaged in research ranging from issues of residential development to recreation ecology to climate change. I know she's involved in some bird studies that I've talked to her about and that interests me. Um, she previously for 15 years served as the director of science for the Adirondack program of the Wildlife Conservation Society and she also does some adjunct teaching at a number of dis different institutions. Um, Michele is an, a native of the Adirondacks. She grew up in Lake Placid. So she has that particular connection and love of the region that comes from having been born and grown up there. Well, I don't know if you were born there, but I know you grew up there. And um, she currently lives in Raybrook in the Adirondacks with her husband and children. So welcome, Michele. Thank you. <laughs> Great to have you here this evening. 
So let's start by hearing about your work at the Adirondack Watershed Institute. What do you actually do in your job at, at AWI? So the Watershed Institute is a program of Paulsmiths College. And Paulsmiths, if folks are not aware, um, is, a, is a small college. We're the only four-year institution in the Adirondack Park. And it's a school that um, has a very strong natural, natural science um, sort of bent to it. That is one of our strongest programs. And so it's a place that someone like me feels very comfortable at home. The Watershed Institute has been around for um, a number of years now, 20 years, doing primarily water quality monitoring and in aquatic invasive species spread prevention. So our mission is basically to protect clean water and the watersheds that support clean water. I, as, as you explained, I came here um, from a position with the Wildlife Conservation Society. And by training, I am, I am not an aquatic biologist. <laughs> I am a terrestrial wildlife ecologist. But my role here as a science director is, is sort of um, partly to do research. I, I don't have a teaching position, although I do help to mentor students and work with them on research projects. Um, but my job involves research that is takes advantage of the, the many decades of of data that have been collected by AWI and using them in some, some projects and trying to publicize those data and get them into the literature and, and go to conferences and represent us with that science. Um, and then also some stuff that I brought here with me that is more on the land side of watersheds. And so most of my, my interest in long-term research has to do more with the things that happen on the land, which of course ultimately influence what happens in the water. Most of the stressors that you know, we're thinking about in water that affect our waterways come originally from, from what happens on the land. So most of my research has more to do with sort of issues of fragmentation and land development and recreation and the ways that we choose to use the land um, and how that impacts wildlife. Yeah, so I, I do a little bit of all those things, plus, you know, grant writing and all that fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it sounds wonderful. Particularly, I think the mentoring of students is, is a really interesting aspect of what you're doing. Um, to those of you who just joined us, welcome. Um, if you have any comments or questions throughout the presentation this evening, please put them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and we'll be sure to feed those into the discussion. And we will have an opportunity to speak directly to Michaeli at the end. So, um, Michaela, the exhibit that's at the Tawny Center right now is an element of a larger project that you've recently had funded, and I know starting in October, you're going to be going on the road with this. Could you talk a little bit about the project that you've gotten funded? Sure. The project's funding comes from the Champlain Valley Natural Heritage Partnership, and that is Lake Champlain Basin Program and the National Park Service together with funds that are supporting really the celebration of the cultural and natural heritage of the Champlain Basin and Watershed. And so our grant is primarily an education and outreach grant, and it's meant to do a couple of things, primarily oriented around celebrating next year's 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. And so my piece is one piece of it, but it also involves um, some activities that we'll do next year during Water Week, which we celebrated the last uh, week of August, and we are going to sort of do a variety of activities associated with Water Week. We're going to sort of culminate this project with some stuff going on at Water Week. Um, we are going to work with partnerships in the basin to take some of our materials and translate them into French, um, again, to try to build more cross-cultural relationships and collaborations. And, and part of my piece will actually allow me to travel at least to a few spots um, within the basin in, in New York and Vermont and Quebec um, to reach out with this project to students and try to get them involved in it. So it's a little bit of, of, of a variety of activities around education and outreach, primarily to celebrate the Clean Water Act and understand sort of the challenges and the successes that have been associated with the implementation of the Clean Water Act. And for, for me, particularly, how we can represent that in this kind of unique way with a fiber art project. Great. Um, we've had somebody comment here that she's particularly interested in your motivation, which we're going to be getting to in not too long. Um, but first, I want to kind of set the stage here before we even get to the science part. Um, Michaela, you're actually a pretty terrific um, fiber artist, even apart from this project. And um, we're actually going to bring up on the screen some work of yours. So um, the, these two sweaters that we're looking at are actually uh, sweaters that Michele entered in a sweater competition here at the Tawny Center. I'm crazy about fiber arts and we do a lot of programming related to that. And every couple of years, 
we usually have some sort of a knitting competition. So the sweater on the right, which is a fair isle cardigan, um, took best in show actually in a, in a very competitive uh, class of sweaters. And um, the one on the left is a bog jacket by a designer named Elizabeth Zimmerman, which those of you who are familiar with knitting, knitwear designers will certainly know that name. And that I can't remember, was that second place, first or second place? So I, I mention all of this because the pieces we're gonna be looking at this evening um, don't require a high level of technical proficiency to make. And that's an important thing about the accessibility of this project. Um, they are, the, the pieces we'll be looking at, I think a, a lot of the strength of them is the conception behind them and the thinking about them and how best to present data. But I did want you all to know that Mi Kelly actually really has chops as a fiber artist and does some very elaborate and beautiful projects. So these are just a couple of examples. So how did you get into doing this kind of work, Mi Kelly? Uh, as to the best of my ability to remember, my grandmother taught me to knit when I was about 10. I can remember sitting on her couch and learning with her. And I think that that's about how old I was. And I just did it all the time when I was a kid. I had a, a close friend of mine who I'm still very close with. And she and I spent a lot of time doing things like knitting sweaters for these little bears that we played with. You know, it was that kind of thing um, for most of my childhood. But I never really went too far away from it. I eventually graduated into trying to make more elaborate things and, and got into sweaters and, and blankets and things like that. I think that. You know, there was a bit of a hiatus during um, school and graduate school and, and having young children, but then coming back to it after my children were a little bit older and coming into coming kind of back to knitting in a world where the internet is much more prevalent and Ravelry exists and now it's just sort of amazing. And so in recent years, I've, I've um, you know, I'm kind of obsessed, I guess my husband would say I'm obsessed. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who don't know, Ravelry is an online community of knitters and you can make knitting friends there and access patterns and learn about designers, all kinds of things. So how did you get the idea, Michele, to combine your love of science and your love of fiber work in this project? Um, I guess I always was a little bit interested in the idea of of knitting data or knitting things related to science. The bog jacket that you showed, um, I was influenced to make that pattern uh, because I stumbled upon the fact that Elizabeth Zimmerman had a pattern for something called the bog jacket because I've, I've worked in peatlands studying bog birds for, for a long time now. And so I said, I have to make a bog jacket. <laughs> And then I experimented with felting it, which was kind of a different thing. But the little bird that I, I put on there is, is a rusty blackbird. It's one of the rarest birds we have in New York State. It's one of the ones I'm trying to find in my counts year after year. And so I guess the idea has sort of always been in the back of my head. But um, if you poke around on the internet, you can find some really fun and neat examples of, of knitted data. Um, and the best one, and I think the one that has inspired me a lot in this project is, is the Tempestry project, um, which is, I will talk about, I think at some point, there, there you go. Um, yeah. The Tempestry project is, a, is a, a huge project that anyone can participate in. And it is around the idea of representing temperature data, representing climate change again, in this sort of blending of, of fiber art with scientific data. And so those are tempestries. The, the picture on the left there is um, a set of three tempestries that my friend Heidi Rowland did. She is in a little group of folks that I have been trying to um, coalesce around making a tempestry collection for the Adirondacks. Um, what you see in each of those, I think hers are linen stitch, but you could use you know knitting, crochet, weaving. Um, you see represented the at the maximum daily temperature for each day of the year. And I forget the exact years that Heidi did, but it's three years that have, you know, significance for her life. And so a lot of folks will pick two different years or a number of different years and be able to see the extent to which the patterns in that temperature record have changed over time. The idea of knitting uh, temperature data isn't necessarily a new thing. You can find all kinds of examples of how people make temperature blankets. That's kind of a popular thing to do. But I love what the Tempestry Project did, which was to sort of 
take this idea and standardize it and, and make a, a sort of a color palette for everyone to use and a pattern for everyone to use and a way to access the data that everyone could use so that ultimately you could create collections and this has been done in lots of places, collections to represent a given location through time. Um, there's a tempestry collection for all the national parks um, and then you can sort of develop this, you know, nationwide thing where we're all kind of working with the same, same pattern and the same template and really start to see some patterns. And then you get into the power of not just the art of it, but the science too, to see the change. And so the tempestry folks and, and one of them is on this, on this um, meeting and might have more to say than me, but I know they've used them to talk with, with legislators and they've used them in climate marches. And I think that's, Terrific. So that is, that is a huge inspiration to me. I think what, what's been done with that project is fantastic. And one of the things I love about Tempestry and consequently uh, things that you have done and, and that we'll be talking about from the exhibit is that for a person like me, who's not really inclined to read, you know, data charts and elaborate scientific studies, at a glance, you can see what, what's important about the data. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, very compelling that, you know, you can easily access it and it makes it very easy to speak to a very general public about this subject at a glance. So that, that's great. And um, you have an Adirondack cl uh, club, so to speak, as, as you said, around Tempestry. And I know that a number of people really are working with you to cover different years for the Adirondack region. Yeah, we. I started trying to get that group together right before COVID. It was spectacularly bad timing because I envisioned us all sitting together and working on these together. And then it kind of, you know, COVID prevented us from doing that. But there is still a small group of us um, that are that are chipping away at them. And, and Heidi has, has done three. <laughs> she's, she's ahead of me. I've done one and a half. Um, but I'm trying and, you know, there's no timeline. I'm just excited for anyone who might want to be involved in this. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk later in this program about how people can get involved. So let's move on to the next slide. So this is Michaeli's um, climate dress, which she's modeling in the <laughs> photo on the right, um, and actually wore for a march, I understand. So I, I related to this, um, every piece that we're gonna be looking at is in a different form. So I wonder when you start thinking about a, a given set of data and wanting to represent it in fiber, how do you think through what form to give that, whether it's gonna be a scarf or a hat or a wall hanging, how do you think those projects through? I don't know that I have a, a really specific um, process for doing that. I think in the case of this dress, I did want something that I could wear to an event. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the data in this dress is, is also temperature data, but what it is is the uh, deviation from normal temperature. So the Tempestry Project also has these kits that you can do. And, and what this enables you to see is change sort of within one piece. So each row, this goes back to 1880, I believe. Each row is a year and the color represents, you know, how far our temperatures are deviating from long-term normals, as they call them. And you know, when you get to the bottom, you get to the more recent years and you can see it's, we're deviating more and more from what we think of as kind of our normal temperature regime. And so I did want something that I, that I could wear and I'm not sure where I got the idea for a dress, but it seemed like a fun thing to try to do. Um, some of the other pieces in the, in the collection are, um, for example, the idea for the hat that my, I was sitting with our director one day and he said, you know, could you make a hat where you represent lake turnover and you literally turn it over? <laughs> I said, sure, I can do that. Um, I love to make felted bags, so I made the hab bag. Um, I, I, my favorite things are sweaters and shawls, and so shawls I just default to all the time, and I like to make those. The scarf is, is, uh, is easy, so I guess it's just kind of not, not a real um, standardized process, but, but I'm, I'm interested in trying all kinds of different things. And one of the things I did want to do with this project was to illustrate that these pieces don't just have to be art. You know, some of them are kind of kooky and maybe if you're not as obsessed as I am, you wouldn't necessarily want to knit the dissolved oxygen profile for a lake, for example. Um, but you might want to knit something that you could wear. Um, and because, you know, it could be a scientific message, it could also just be some nice piece of knitwear. So part of it was utility. So the colors that are really light, do, do any of the colors in this dress represent years when the temperature was significantly below the expected average for the year? 
Yes, the darkest ones would be that. And I ha it's been a long time since I've looked at the data, but yet the darkest would be below average. And then, you know, the warmest ones at the top there would be where we're getting, <laughs> getting yeah. hotter. Okay, wonderful. And I apologize to any of you who might be hearing all the noise in the background from fire engines and so forth. There's something going on in the background here. So I'm sorry if you're hearing that. Um, okay, let's go on to the next slide because you, you mentioned the scarf. Me, Kelly. Um, yeah. This is the Lake Champlain scarf. And I like this one especially, not only because it looks great, and we'll see that in, in another slide in a moment, but it's a very simple concept for uh, representing the data associated with the study. So tell us about this particular study and the scarf that you made to represent it. Yeah, these are, these are long-term records of uh, the, the lake. Well, the graphic is, is the actual freezing dates, but what I Put in the scarf is just did Lake Champlain freeze or not? Um, going back to I want to say it's 1818 that record and the record is I have the link for it um, in the information that's next to the display and on the video about this project. But it's it's right on the NOAA website. You can you can uh, type in you know Lake Champlain ice closing dates and get the information. So it's one of the long term records for ice that we have on lakes. Um, and all I did was just to, I chose a pattern that was kind of wavy <laughs> to look like uh, water. And the, the lighter color, the grayish white color is years that the lake didn't freeze. And then the bluish color is years, or years that the lake did freeze, excuse me. And the bluish color is years when it didn't. And so from left to right in that image is, is starting, I, I think it's 1818 um, to 2019 or 2020. And you can just see immediately that the, the frequency of years that the lake doesn't freeze completely has increased a lot over time. Um, so it's a pretty simple one. And those I think are some of the easier scientific messages if you're dealing with a like yes or no kind of a thing to represent just simply with two colors. Um, there are, if you look at this um, a little bit more closely, there are some white beads that are in three different columns and those represent whether or not the date that the lake froze, if it did freeze, was January or February or March. And there's also been some shift of those dates. So when the lake is freezing, it's shifting toward freezing later. So you can sort of, that's a harder one to see unless you're up close <laughs> with the scarf, but you can sort of see those two patterns of the lake is freezing less than it used to all the way and it's freezing sort of later in the season. And so that's, that's you know, a relatively simple message, but kind of, as you say, one that's, it's pretty evident to be able to see right, right away. Exactly. And so if we go to the next slide where we've got it, you know, sort of on a mannequin, the way a person would wear it, you know, one of the things I love about this project in terms of accessibility is that you might very well wear the scarf to a dinner party or, you know, out to some social gathering and somebody might admire the scarf just because it's attractive, you know, aesthetically and the fiber is nice. But then to be able to say, yes, but you know what, it's also telling a story. I mean, I just love that to, you know, walk around with your science data around your neck. Right. <laughs> um, that to me is a very effective form of, of advocacy and, and that appeals to me a lot. Yes. So we just wanted you to see how nice it would look if you actually wore it. Um, Someone has commented, I would definitely wear that scarf and would love to talk with others about it. <laughs> so this piece that we're looking at now is quite simple in terms of its construction and all of that. You'll talk about that a little bit. This was for me the most mind blowing thing of any of the pieces that you made in terms of the data it represents because it was complete news to me. So um, tell us about this piece, which you actually made the weekend before the exhibit opened so that it could be included <laughs> last minute. Brought it to you when it was still wet. Yes. <laughs> I, if I remade this one, I would make it with yarn that was a little bit bigger. But but what I wanted to do um, with this one was to talk about the issue of microplastics, which are pervasive in our environment. Um, and there's really nothing, you know, this is just a simple piece of uh, plain stockinette knitting in which I use these beads that my son has some toy, I don't even remember what it was, <laughs> that involved these beads that he had when he was, when he was younger and I still have them. <laughs> and they're perfect little plastic beads to knit into a project. And so the font, although it's, it does, it's a little bit hard to see, but the font is kind of a, a retro 50s-ish looking font. And that's to kind of represent the decade when plastic production in this country kind of went you know, real into high gear. 
Um, and the total number of stitches, I won't remember exactly, but I think it's something like 10,400. Um, that is right in line with estimates of the number of microplastic fibers that are released in um, monitoring stations on in, in wastewater, you know, places where such things are monitored, going into Lake Champlain every single day. So the estimates, this is work that um, my friend Danielle Garneau and her students did at SUNY Plattsburgh, um, estimated that between 10 and 15,000 individual pieces of micro microplastics are released into the lake every day, just at those monitored stations. And so microplastic comes from all kinds of different sources, of course, litter on the ground, but also our clothing. When we have synthetic clothing, we can release microplastics from that. And it unfortunately gets into the system. It gets accumulated by organisms. It can be, um, it can harbor um, things like PCBs and heavy metals and things we don't want. It can then sort of bioaccumulate up the food chain. So it's really a, a not something we want <laughs> in our environment. And it's, and it's these teeny tiny pieces that escape us um, and escape some treatment facilities, unfortunately. And so this is something that I think is, it's kind of pervade, it's one of those environmental problems which once you start to look for it, you find it everywhere. Um, but I think, as you say, I'm not sure how many people are, are aware of how pervasive it is. And I think we even as scientists aren't entirely aware of, of what it means yet for us. You know, you mm -hmm. see the pictures on the internet of animals with their bellies full of, of bigger pieces of plastic, but these little pieces, also can be uh, can add up in our, in our environment and be problematic too. Well, and having spoken to you and, and knowing that one of the sources of this, as you said, is from the clothing we wear and the sort of the water coming out of our washing machines, mm -hmm. you know, it really gives you pause about the selection of fabric that you wear, you know, the kind of garments you wear and whether or not you should really be making a point to wear natural fibers and maybe yeah. do some hand washing too. <laughs> right, there, there have been some attempts to, um, to address this through um, the core. There's a, a company called Coraball, for example, that makes this um, silicone sphere thing that you can toss into your washer that tries to capture some of these um, fibers. Um, and I, there is some, some regulatory um, efforts also, like micro beads have been banned in certain kinds of cosmetic products, but I think it, it will remain a challenge just because we love synthetic clothing. <laughs> it has a lot of benefits and, <laughs> and advantages, but but it is it is truly sort of a, a a side product of something that we maybe don't recognize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's that was definitely a new one for me. So let's go into the next one, and this is one that people love because <laughs> it, it's just cute for one thing. This little frog. People, you, you gave permission for people to touch things in the exhibit, and everyone <laughs> picks up the frog. Oh, I hope they did. <laughs> But the, but the frog is carrying an important message with the beads on its back. So what what's the study here? So the frog is about um, sodium and chloride and road salt, which is a, a source of sodium and chloride in our waterways. We use enormous amounts of road salt and that has sort of been the case for a long time, but kind of accelerated, at least within the Adirondacks, um, kind of got to very, very high levels in association with when the Olympics came to Lake Placid. And it sort of has the, the standard of, of, you know, expecting dry roads has kind of been maintained ever since that time. And so we use a really profound amount of road salt, not just here. And although New York State does use more than a lot of places, but, you know, all throughout places that are snowy like ours um, and where we want to be able to still drive as fast as we do uh, in the rest of the year. And so that salt, um, of course, gets onto the roadways. If you, uh, I know probably everybody on this call has driven behind a salt truck. You have seen that, you know, it doesn't necessarily go only on the road. You can see those little bits of, <laughs> of salt bouncing off of the side of the road. Um, it, and then it, you know, unfortunately gets into our waterways. And so one of the trends that we have seen is increasing levels of sodium and chloride in some of our lakes that we monitor as part of our long-term monitoring. We have also looked at the prevalence of, of um, road salt impacts in our uh, wells, where we did a well study of, of folks in the Adirondacks and found you know, a, an alarming number of wells that have levels of chloride that are, that are even in some cases above what the EPA sort of sets as the limit for you know, healthy human conditions. And so this is a problem because once it's in our system, it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere, it just accumulates. Um, the issue that I, I picked the frog, partly just because it was cute, 
Um, but there was a study, and there have been other studies as well that are focused on amphibians. Um, one study from the Darren Freshwater Institute looked at uh, the ability of, of salt uh, of chloride to change the sex ratios of, tadpole, of wood frog tadpoles. So we know it can have biological impl uh, implications for wildlife, um, but also for human health. It's just something we need to again try to try to be aware of and think about. And there's there's all kinds of efforts um, trying to do that, but it's it's another challenge that I think is sometimes goes unseen, but is a really important one. And this particular one, I have been seeing and reading that uh, it's gotten attention in the Adirondacks and yes. there are people working to really try to solve this, to try to find, to, to um, try to work with municipalities to use alternatives to salt and to work with them to have them maybe salt less and, and try to make some headway on this particular challenge. Yes, that is true. And that's a, yeah. that's a good, a good progress is starting to be made. I think that um, it will remain a, a challenge because we do have this there is also a human safety concern associated with it, but we have, we passed the Randy uh, Preston Road Salt Reduction Act in New York State, which is aimed at creating a, a task force that will look specifically at this issue and look at solutions for New York State. And our science was yeah. a part of, of that uh, that process. So that's been, it's been a great outcome for us. Wonderful. So um, we're, we're just gonna talk about two more pieces from the exhibit. We're not gonna show you everything tonight, partly because we hope you'll come and see it, but also because we wanna have time to talk about a few other things. So there are just two more pieces we're gonna talk about. Let's let's go on to the next one. This is called the Hab Bag, Harmful Algal Blooms. Uh, this is a felted bag. Michaela was talking earlier about the fact that she likes to make felted bags. I think algal blooms is something that most camp owners in the Adirondacks would be able to relate to. It's, you know, it's a source of much discussion and hand wringing with uh, camp uh, owners associations around a lot of lakes in the Adirondacks. I know a lot of camp communities are trying to wrestle with this and doing all kinds of things to try to improve water quality so that they don't have this. But tell us what an algal bloom is, what it means, and why it's a bad thing. So they are, they result from sort of uncontrolled growth of, of microscopic algae, and they become problematic when they sort of explode in these growth patterns. Of course, you know, algae in lakes is is natural and, and blooms of algae are natural, but there are conditions under which they become sort of uncontrolled growth. And then we get these harmful, as they call them, algal blooms, which can be associated with toxins that are that are dangerous and can even be um, deadly to dogs and to, to other organisms. And so they have been gathering a tremendous amount of attention. If you go to a water quality conference nowadays, they're guaranteed to be many, many, many talks about about HABs and what we can do about HABs and trying to figure out what's driving them. I believe that there are, you know, climate change uh, factors related to harmful algal blooms. And so that was just the issue that I was trying to illustrate here and that the state does track them. There's a website that you can look at the map for uh, reported HABs for any given year, the ones that people are, have called in and reported and, and somebody has checked on and confirmed if it's a, if it's a harmful bloom or not. Um, and these are, you know, by no means limited to our kind of an ecosystem. They can happen in lots of places, but these are the data for lakes in the Adirondacks. You can go back in the archive of information from DEC. And I just made a little <laughs> puff stitch harmful algal bloom blob on that bag for each of the ones that, that have happened in the park um, recorded by the state since 2012. And so the top row of the bag has five of them. And as you move down, you move through up to 2020 and there's, there's 15. So they, again, are increasing over time. And this is, is what's being seen in a number of different places. Why I did this as a bag, I'm not really sure. I just <laughs> thought it was fun, but, um, but I like the look of those little nubbins popping out on there. I think it kind of- Bobbles. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, bobbles. Um, what causes the blooms? I mean, what are the conditions that are making these blooms happen? Um, I am probably not the best authority on this, but I know that conditions of shallow water with a lot of light, um, warm and not a lot of movement, like still water, I think can, can result in blooms um, and can contribute to blooms, but that's, that's a limited answer of a, of a topic that I don't know. Right. All right. Something All to look more into if you're interested, folks. <laughs> there are lots of studies out there. Yes. Um, and again, I would absolutely walk around carrying this bag and be delighted to chat with people <laughs> along the way about what this all was. Um, okay, so we have one more to talk about from the exhibit. And then as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll move on and talk about other things. So you talked earlier about liking to make shawls. This is an example of a shawl you made. This is called Racket Rack, Wrap 
referring to Racket Lake, not the Racket River. Um, so what is represented here? So I, I put two things in this one. One is um, the, the, you can see on the top graph there, the transparency of Racket Lake, which has shown a pattern of decline in the years that we have been monitoring it. Um, Racket Lake has been in our Adirondack Lake Assessment Program for a long time. And so we have volunteers who participate in our ALEP program who collect water samples for us every summer. They then come to our lab and we do the, the um, analysis on a bunch of different parameters to measure water quality over time. And one of the things that we track is the transparency of a lake. So that is the degree to which the lake is clear. How deep can you see basically? So we use what's called a Secchi disc. It's just a round disc that has a really um, high contrast black and white sort of pattern. And you put it in, you know, deep down the lake and figure out the depth at which that you can still see the pattern on the Secchi disc. That pattern of transparency in Racket Lake and in a number of the lakes that we monitor for ALAP has been declining over time. So the lakes are getting darker. Um, this is something that we as people <laughs> tend to not like. We like our lakes to be clear. <laughs> Um, but it's interesting because there are some mechanisms by which this could be related to climate change. However, there are, I think, also a, a fair amount of evidence on the side that this is actually representing a recovery from acid rain, which was, you know, enormously troubling and problematic for our aquatic resources in the Adirondacks, and from which many of them, at least on the lake side, have recovered a lot. So. Colleagues of mine, for example, have written a paper about a lake closer up to here called Bear Pond, which everybody loved because it was just this beautiful crystal clear lake, but it was a dead lake. <laughs> it doesn't look like that anymore. It now is, is dark and it's, it's full of all kinds of stuff. Um, and in that case, I believe it's, it's, you know, it's because it has recovered from that acidification. So the transparency trend is one we're seeing in a number of our lakes, which could be a negative thing related to climate change, but it's also possible that it's just a recovery process. And, Although we like the lake to be clear, we might just be seeing more biological activity and more organisms in the lake, which is good. Um, so that is what's represented in the blue colors on the shawl. And then because I'm a bird person, I wanted to, to, to include some bird data in this one because I similarly have been monitoring the birds in all, if anyone's been to Racket Lake, I've been monitoring the birds in most of those um, inlets to Racket. They're, these are these beautiful, peatland um, boreal river corridor corridors that come into Racket Lake. The Marion River Fen is the one that the 90 miler goes through. If anybody is um, does the 90 miler canoe race here, uh, the South Inlet Fen, the Beaver Brook Fen. So those are um, a type of habitat that I've been studying and in particular the birds within it for a long time, um, a similar duration of time to the, to the monitoring of the lake for ALAP. And I've been watching a a suite of sort of specialized birds that we have in the Adirondacks that are very, very northern species. They're sort of our Canadian bird friends that are on the southern range extent of where they occur here in the Adirondacks. You can't find these birds if you're down, um, you know, by New York City or if you're out in the Finger Lakes. You got to come to the Adirondacks and then you have to come to these like peatland, neat, northern flavor um, habitat types. And so I've been tracking birds in those places for a number of years. And unfortunately, they too, most of the ones that I've been tracking are declining. And that is probably as a result of climate change. That's a little bit more clear because they are Northern species adapt to a Northern kind of climate um, and a Northern kind of habitat. And retreat of those species to the North is something that we're seeing with many, many taxa kind of all over the globe. So the birds are in the green and the, the blue is, uh, is the declining transparency within Racket Lake. So I, I just put the two of them together in that piece. And going, uh, focusing again on the transparency part, um, when we were talking yesterday, Shuka made a comment about looking at this work and thinking, oh, it's so beautiful, but wait, it's telling a bad, bad news story. Um, and this one piece out of all the pieces in the exhibit is probably, I believe the only one that potentially is telling good news, right? The others really are all pointing to degradation and decline and, and challenges like that. Yes, and so that's my challenge with this project to seek out some other example, the good story examples as well. And I, I have come across a few and I just haven't made any pieces yet, but there, you know, there are great stories of recovery of birds, for example, 
um, and, and other, other particularly acid rain recovery is a great one to illustrate. Um, so it's, it's not all bad news. It's just kind of easier to find the bad stories. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, and, and to activate people around those stories, yeah. that makes sense. Because yes. I mean, one of the appeals of this project from Tony's perspective is that we're interested in the vernacular, you know, the informal, the non-institutionalized. And this is such an example of vernacular advocacy. And so, of course, you want to point out the things we need to be working on and that need improvement. It, you know, it's easy to forget some of the triumphs and maybe we shouldn't focus too much on those because then we can overlook the things that we really need to be attending to. So I think that's great. Now, of course, you're always working on new projects. And so our final slide is actually going to be to look at a work in progress, which is a <laughs> series that you call noxious necklaces. What are noxious necklaces? <laughs> so one of the two very large programs for us is our aquatic invasive species spread prevention program. Folks may have run into us at the boat launches all over the park and over in the Champlain. Um, we are the folks that are wearing those big blue uh, vests and stopping to talk to you if you show up at the boat about invasive species, which are an enormous problem everywhere on the planet. We happen to be focused on the aquatic side to try to prevent the introduction of these species into our lakes and or the spread of them to other lakes that they're not currently in. So these necklaces <laughs> are three different um, aquatic invasive species that we focus on among many, trying to prevent them from, from arriving and then spreading around in our landscape more than they already have been. So the top one is zebra mussel. I'm sure most folks have probably heard of zebra mussel. I tried to make the little black things kind of look like a boat propeller because they tend to accumulate on, um, on boat motors and other parts of, um, of watercraft and create these huge infestations. And so um, those are zebra mussels. The middle one is Asian clam. Um, and that's another um, mussel that can uh, impact our native species and, and create lots of problems that way. Uh, the bottom one, which is my favorite one is, is water chestnut. And that's probably the one that we have um, maybe the most visible in some places in the Adirondacks. Um, there's tremendous water chestnut control program in, um, in Lake Champlain, for example, in the southern part of Lake Champlain. And they've made a lot of progress on removing that, but water chestnut creates these dense mats and just, you know, it becomes impossible to navigate through some places when water chestnut gets sort of, you know, all over the place, the way that it can grow um, in some of these situations. So those are the ones that are the really pointy, almost medieval, <laughs> dangerous looking. <laughs> those are kind of the pods that, you know, float and, and, and have, uh, are associated with the plant. Um, that's the seed pod and they're really durable. I could actually, these are dried out ones, but I could actually stick a needle right through them and and you know, use, use them that way. So I just put these on necklaces because I thought it was an interesting way to, to sort of showcase these species. There's no, no specific data here. It's more about, you know, these are three of the species that we try to stop from, from getting into and spreading around more in our waterways. Ruth commented in the chat that the water chestnut one is the one you'd give to your enemy. Yes. <laughs> 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 they are really, I, I um, poked myself in the finger several times while making that one. Yeah. But they're really dramatic looking. <laughs> they look kind of neat. <laughs> yeah, I think this is cool. I really like this idea of a whole set of necklaces made this way. And I appreciate <laughs> that you went for a propeller shape with the zebra mussels. I think they're clever. So, um, okay, let's, let's um, kind of let everybody come back into the visible space here. And I have just a couple more questions for you. And then again, if you, if any of you would like to speak directly to Michele or say anything yourselves, um, after we just answer a couple more questions, I'll open it up to all of you. So um, let's go back to the idea of motivation, Michele. Um, what motivates you overall for this project and what are you hoping is gonna come out of it? It's not hard to motivate me for anything that involves fiber because I like you and the fiber persons. So this is like what I do when I go home at night, even though it's still sort of work associated, I would otherwise be knitting something else almost at any moment. Um, under my desk, there are three or four different knitting projects that live here all the time. Um, as I, I know folks from this call probably are the same. So the motivation from that side of it is, is it's just always there. It's, it's um, a, a habit that I find so relaxing um, 
so sort of stress relieving and one that I do, although I haven't really, I've taught a few people here and there how to knit. I, um, I'm not an instructor by any means, but it's one that I want to share with as many people as I can, just from the standpoint of knitting, because I think it, you know, particularly for maybe young people in a college setting who are stressed out, you know, it's a great way to kind of just chill out a little bit, I think. And it helps me at least, you know, if I'm in a meeting or sitting on a, on a conference call, I, it's hard to explain, but you know, I'm paying better attention if I'm knitting. It means that my hands are occupied, but I'm not checking my email. I'm not looking at something else. So on that side of that side of it, I just am, am thrilled to, to share knitting or crochet or Tunisian crochet or any of these things with folks. Cause I think it's, it's a, it's a activity that I wish everybody, you know, could enjoy as much as I do. Um, on the science side, I'm equally, driven to share these messages. And that's part of my job. I'm thrilled that we got a grant. I did, had no idea if this grant would succeed, but I'm thrilled that it did. Um, and I'm always happy to find creative ways to kind of share this information. I think for someone like me who, although I have worked in conservation for a lot of years, I'm not a particularly outspoken kind of person, but craftivism <laughs> is a way of, of sort of putting your, you know, knowledge and feelings about something out there in, in a way that's that's it's still art it's still very beautiful and i think maybe that might bring in a different um set of folks too who are who are less inclined maybe to knock on the door of their legislator and say you should do x y and z but but hey if i could you know show you this neat fiber piece that illustrates something that you you might otherwise have never paid any attention to this particular issue but if you see it in this way maybe it gets their attention so I like, I like that word craftivism. I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, so you're hoping that people will get more educated, that they'll learn more about what's really going on um, on this front. Are you hoping they'll take action in some way? I'm hoping that they, at the very least, will will sort of understand and and you know celebrate with us the Clean Water Act and how think about how important water is in our lives. That's one of the things I've noticed working on this project is just that I spend all this time. I mean, it is it is the Lake Champlain Basin Program. And so I, I've learned a tremendous amount about Lake Champlain, which is this huge, enormous, wonderful resource right next door that I don't otherwise pay a lot of attention to. And if I can learn that much, even though I already work for a watershed institute, I hope that other folks will too. I don't think it needs to be confined to Lake Champlain. I think, you know, the idea is the Clean Water Act, how it's been important in our lives. And so I hope that people will take away from that, you know, reflecting on just the degree to which water is just, it's fundamental to our lives. Um, I would love if folks take action, but even if that action is just to join us in this project, that will be terrific. That'll be absolutely wonderful. So how do people get involved? Um, at the moment, the best thing to do is just email me. Um, I am in the process of trying to develop a website, a Google form, something that, that is going to sort of put together the data sets. You know, I'd like to curate a collection of data sets that are easy and accessible. And I'd like to, I, you know, this is me still fantasizing. The grant hasn't even officially started yet, but um, I would love to do this in a kind of a choose your own adventure sort of way, because I want to be able to involve everyone from the student who told me yesterday that she doesn't know how to knit but wants to participate to the person that um, doesn't that never uses a pattern and always knits their, out of their own imagination all the time. I think there's ability to, to sort of span that whole spectrum. So I'm experimenting with some projects that you wouldn't even need to know how to knit. I'm trying to do some really simple weaving. I've never done any weaving before, but it's great fun. <laughs> so I've been doing some weaving that I think that could be accessible. Um, to people, I think if we get into the younger um, school kids sort of level, you know, even very simple things with beading is something that they could do. But then I also want to welcome somebody who likes to knit, but, you know, give me the pattern and tell me exactly what to do. I will do that um, all the way to just give me this concept and I'll figure out my own project. So what I would like to do is, is to create sort of a website with these these different options and that people can we can share information together and and, um, and ultimately share these products together the idea of the grant is that we do this for a, a year close to a year and then next year during uh water week the last week of august we share our the products that have come out of this and so that will be some combination of in person if anybody comes to you know where we are and participates in some of our water week events but also online events where we can share 
information too. I have talked with a couple of um, local art studios around here who are like, oh, it'd be great to do an event where we, you know, at the end of this, we all bring our pieces together and talk about them. So that's that's my hope. At the moment, email me and I'm I'm sort of putting together a collection of people. And ultimately I will hopefully have a website where we can all sort of gather and talk. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you, Michele. Okay, so this is the part of the program now. Um, oh, Justin is saying, we'd love to talk to you about our tempestries for non-knitters. Justin, yeah. do you wanna unmute yourself or do you want me to un us to unmute you so that you can talk about that a little bit? Uh, just based on what you were just saying, um, you know, people who aren't knitters or crocheters, but wanna participate, we've got, um, came up with this idea for school kids that we're actually gonna do it in workshops at Ursinus College in a couple of weeks. Um, but it's just like using the four inch wide Velcro strips and sticking like little pre-cut lengths of yarn on them. And then you can make a little mini tempestry. It's like this big, oh, you that's can great. do like the new normal data, like your dress and you can do, just do like the last 70 years. It'll be like this big and get a little, you know, write up about it or, you know, show the, the graph of the actual data and then they have something to take home. It doesn't take very long to make and it's really just intuitive and easy. But we, we can totally talk about hooking you up with some of that kind of stuff. For... Yeah, that's great. I didn't know that. Yeah, that would be a great thing to add to what you're doing, Michele, in, in yeah. the local scene. Yeah. I had seen uh, yarn painting examples, but not with Velcro. That's even easier than what I had looked up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I love the idea of yarn, yarn painting. Um, Judith has just commented that she loves how inclusive and welcoming this project is. Well, I appreciate that and I want it to be. I think that knitters as a as a group and crocheters and fiber people are 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 largely knit, you know, inclusive and welcoming and they, you know, love to participate in things together, love to do knit alongs and crochet alongs and at least, you know, and bring other people in, come and join. bring other people in and let's all do this together. Yeah. Even if we're all at home on our computers and talking on Zoom. So um, I, you know, the grant is, is going to, we, we wrote it a little bit to target school kids, but I recognize that, you know, I don't know to what extent they, they know how to knit and I want it to be, you know, out there for everybody. So. Absolutely. Well, and as you say, it doesn't just have to be knitting. There are all different kinds right. of fiber techniques. And as Justin has just described something super, super basic working with fiber. So it's fun to, I think it would be fun. Maybe some of you listening will think about this. Um, you know, what other fiber techniques might there be that we haven't talked about yet? What about something besides fiber? One of the questions, we've had a couple of climate uh, study or climate uh, course students come to the Tawny Center to see the exhibit. And one of the questions is, um, you know, how would you make this kind of data publicly accessible? It may not be fiber at all. There may be some other way. What other good way? Oops, right, somebody here is answering paper making. I know there are lots of folks at SLU working with that. That's a great idea. I think doing something with paper making would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. So that could be brought into it. Um, there's also a question here about how can, you, this is from Don, how can you move this kind of project from inspiration to behavior change? And are you measuring any reactions or actions from visitors to the display? So in terms of the display here at the Tawny Center, I'll answer that. I anecdotally can tell you that people have been very interested and that a couple of people have asked me how they can get involved in the project to help move it forward and, and get more involved. Um, I'm, I'm here, we at the Tawny Center have not actually um, measured any actions that our visitors might have taken. So the answer on our end is no, we haven't done that. But what, what would you say, Michaeli? How do we inspire behavior change? <laughs> An easy question from Don. <laughs> <laughs> um, I the grant honestly was was just you know from the folks that think about cultural and natural heritage and um, and and it was a piece of a bigger grant and so we didn't think anything about what I would love to do which was get together with my colleague Heidi and do the social science part of this project where we ultimately do measure behavior change but that would be a much more involved project. I, I'm already thinking about how we could make this more than just a one-year grant and make it more of a permanent thing and, and, and ultimately could do some of that because that would be really neat. Um, but says, yes, got me up. thinking about looking out there for, for people that have tried to figure out how um, these kinds of projects have 
if they have and and, and well let's think them. about uh, related to that then what kinds of behavior changes given the the kinds of studies we talked about tonight the six prod, prod pieces objects that we looked at i mean for the plastics one thinking more carefully about the clothes you buy and what the fiber content is would be an obvious one right um, and and in general thinking about plastics in your life but related to some of these others what kinds of behavior changes could there be? And I, I'm putting this out not just to Michele, but to all of you. Um, you know, road salt or um, what? What were some of the other um, topics? You know, al algal blooms. And Don, you have something you'd like to say? Sure. I guess the reason that I asked the question, which um, was not an easy question, sorry, Michele. Um, <laughs> is I'm I'm an advisor to Polar Bears International, and we're doing a lot on the on the climate change front. And so we're putting together, we, we already have um, an action kit that where people can take action in their personal lives about climate change. And then we're putting together an advocacy kit as well. So um, kind of inspire, educate, act and, and advocate, right? Um, and so that's kind of the road that I was going down and, and it just seems like it would, I love STEM to STEAM. So it's it's easy to get people involved in this kind of thing through art, like what McKaylee's done. So. Oh, Don, I'm gonna call you and ask you all about this. I yeah, no, that, that would be a wonderful you. connection. <laughs> <laughs> Don is my former colleague at WCS and a fellow wildlife person. And I am absolutely gonna call you up and ask for your materials. And then I'm gonna take them to my STEM students that I help to mentor and maybe use them as a test case. But that gives me grand ideas for, you know, the next grant I could try to get. That's well, and the other the other piece here, um, Michele, is that in, in the chat, there's a discussion about specific paper makers who might be interested in getting involved with this, some paper makers who are at SLU. So you, you may have some new friends to work with who are working with fiber differently than you are. Yeah. Um, we also have a suggestion here from Fran who said it would be wonderful and collaborative to have people create same size squares depicting specific related data and join them together into an Afghan. Oh yes, that's a great idea. Um, one of the pieces that uh, is in the display that was meant to sort of, sort of represent how you could engage on a daily basis is an Afghan, which I only made like five or six pieces of, but. Um, what I did there was to go to, we have a, um, a floating platform that sits in Upper Saranac Lake during the summer months and it, it collects all kinds of water quality data, you know, measures all sorts of things at various intervals uh, until, the, until the ice when we have to pull it out. But you can go to um, uppersaranacmonitoring.com <laughs> anytime and sort of pull up all kinds of, of information. I was just going there periodically and writing down um, wind speed and wind direction and some other things and making an Afghan square that had colors to represent those different things with the idea that you could do this for as short or as long a period of time as you wanted and, and make a blanket or make you know whatever you want. But I love the idea of doing it where, where everybody does their own square and put them together. That would be even better. That would be great. Good suggestion, Fran, thank you. Um, other comments, questions, anybody else want to unmute and speak directly to Michele? Okay. Um, I guess this is a heck of a time for me to tell you this, but I hope you all notice that we have been recording this evening's event and we will be <laughs> posting this. So um, hopefully none of you object to that. If you do, please let me know. Um, again, we would love to have you get more involved with Tawny. We do a lot of exciting things in this organization and there's really um, something for everyone here, I think it's fair to say. So um, you can start following us in Facebook or Instagram. We post daily. We're at the Tawny Center in both places. If you would like to start re receiving our digital e newsletter, which goes out twice a month, you can email Shuka shuka at tawny.org and we'll sign you up for the e-newsletter. If any of you have thoughts about projects you're working on that you think, hmm, that sounds like it's related to Tawny's mission and we might really like to show what we're doing, we'd be delighted to have you tell us about what you're working on, um, particularly pertaining to the gallery where um, Michele's exhibit is now. We have one of the galleries in our space at the Tawny Center 
has been really set aside as a location to showcase what people around the region are doing that are not necessarily the work of the Tawny staff, not necessarily mediated or curated by the Tawny staff, but just a place, a space where people can bring forward projects they're working on that are related to our mission in some way and provide you a platform to be able to share that with more people. So please do be in touch with me, Jill at Tawny.org, if you have anything like that you'd like to talk about. And Shuka, is there anything you'd like to add? Sorry, it took me a while. No, <laughs> no I, I think it was lovely. I was really enjoying the talk Michaela was doing. And I hope like this project will bring a lot of good outcomes. For the behavior changing, I think I don't know anybody else, but I think my behavior will change because of this, you know. Yeah, we, we definitely have been talking on the staff here about what we've learned from this whole thing and, um, you know, each of us has our own particular piece of it that we've been especially surprised by, but it's definitely been a learning experience for all of us. We're not scientists. I'm sure that's obvious to all of you already at this point, <laughs> given what we do. We have no scientists on staff at the Donnie Center. We're folklorists. So um, this has been a wonderful opportunity to, to do this. Um, Kathy has said, the Tang Museum at Skidmore College, oh, I love this, is planning a crochet coral reef in January, 2022 to bring awareness to the impact of warming on world reefs. I wonder if that display could incorporate a temperature aspect. Yeah, that's, that's fabulous. That is fabulous. There are some amazing uh, crochet examples of, of ocean reefs and things like that. I, I can just imagine how great that's going to look. And I would love to go and talk to those, those folks. OK, so Kathy and Michaela, you're going to make that connection. And let me just say <laughs> to you, Kathy, if there's any opportunity that it could possibly come to the Tawny Center at some point down the road, I'm all about it. So <laughs> let, let me know, be in touch about that if that's a possibility. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us this evening, everyone. I've enjoyed it and um, hope to see you at another event in the future. Thank, thank you. you everyone, thank have a good night.